All right, we're, uh, it's time for, us to, time for us to return to business. All right, great. We are, um, our next session is on maximum employment. It's uh, uh, another excellent topic. And uh, our moderator, if everybody would uh, come on in, our, our moderator is uh, Dr. Lisa Cook. She's an associate professor of economics and international relations at Michigan State University. She's also currently director of the AEA summer program and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Previously, Professor Cook was on the faculty of Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. She was at the Pre President's Council of Economic Advisors from 2011 to 2012. Professor Cook's current research interests include economic growth and development, innovation, and financial institutions and markets. She earned a PhD in economics, specializing in macroeconomics and international economics from the University of California, Berkeley. So, uh, Dr. Cook, the floor is yours. Thank you for that generous introduction, President Evans. And I would like to echo Jim Stock's sentiment with respect to the board the chair and the president for undertaking this timely and important review. For this session, we have the dream team of labor economists who uh, are commenting on maximum employment. And uh, we'll start with Catherine Abraham from the University of Maryland. Great. Thank you. It, it really is an, an honor and a, a pleasure to be here this morning to have a chance to uh, talk about this, this topic. Um, let me find the thing. So w one of the challenges that the Federal Reserve System obviously is wrestling with is how to assess the amount of slack in the labor market. I've put up on these slides a, a couple of statements made by current Chair Powell, by former Chair Yellen sort of alluding to the difficulty of figuring out how tight the labor market really is. The way that most people tend to think about labor market tightness is in terms of the relationship between the unemployment rate and U star, the natural rate of, of unemployment. That's the framing for thinking about labor market tightness that's at the core of a lot of models, New Keynesian models of, of the economy, including the, the model that was discussed in the previous session. There is another way to think about what's going on in the labor market that I think is complementary to that, the U and U star perspective, which is the flow and matching approach to thinking about the labor market. If you have unemployment and vacancies, you have jobs that are being filled in labor market equilibrium, the new vacancies flowing in have to be just offset by people finding jobs. So in that sort of canonical search and matching model, labor market tightness can be conceptualized in terms of the ratio of vacancies to unemployment. If you have more vacancies relative to unemployment, the labor market is tighter. That should increase job finding rates, make it harder for employers to fill their jobs, and create upward pressure on, on wages and in turn on prices. One of the puzzles in the current state of the world is that According to standard measures, labor market tightness is higher than it has been at any time in the last 20 years. But if you look at what's happening to wages and prices, there's been very little sign of acceleration in wages and prices. And so that's the, one of the puzzles that the Federal Reserve System is wrestling with. There are, of course, a lot of potential explanations for what's going on. It could be that inflation expectations are simply better anchored than in the past. It could be that globalization has flattened the Phillips curve. It could be that workers just have less bargaining power than in the past. But it also could be that we're not doing a very good job of measuring how tight the labor market is, and that's going to be the focus of, of my presentation. So if we think about the search and matching approach to assessing labor market tightness that I alluded to, at the core of that approach is a matching function, where the number of hires in a given period of time are a function of vacancies and unemployment. In that framework, if the labor market is tighter, if vacancies are higher relative to, to unemployment, um, you would expect the job finding rate with hires relative to unemployment to be higher, 
you would expect the job filling rate to be lower. So we can think of that as a measure of, of the tightness of the labor market, that V over U. The problem is that there are a lot of things that are missing from that standard framework, and I want to just walk through them very briefly. One set of things that's wrong with that standard way of looking at things is that the unemployed are not the only people who are available potentially to fill jobs. So the unemployed themselves are quite heterogeneous. There may, if you, demographics may matter in terms of how likely people are to fill jobs. Their history may matter. Somebody who's been recently employed may be more likely to be available to fill a job than somebody who's just entering the labor market for the first time. How long somebody's been unemployed may matter. The second thing is that a lot of people who are looking for, end up looking for work aren't necessarily unemployed at the time you measure them in the current population survey, they're out of the labor force. There are more people in any given month who take a job who came from being out of the labor force than came from being unemployed. A third thing that the standard framework doesn't incorporate is the fact that employed people can look for jobs. So they're potentially available to fill openings that employers may have. And then on the vacancy side of things, how intensively employers search to fill their vacancies varies over time. In a weak labor market, employers may have vacancies that they're not pushing that hard to fill. In a tighter labor market, they may search harder, they may raise the wages they're offering, they may decide that they're willing to consider people that they wouldn't otherwise have considered so that effective vacancies um, may uh, vary with labor market conditions as well. So what we're trying to do in this paper is to come up with a, a way to think about a generalized measure of labor market tightness that takes into account on the effective searcher side all of these different groups of effective searchers as well as the fact that the intensity of their search may vary over time and on the employer side the intensity with which employers re recruit to fill their vacancies. Um, so we are not um, coming up with original estimates for this purpose. What we're doing in this paper we view as a, a proof of concept. We're going to the literature using estimates in the literature to try to operationalize this concept of generalized labor market tightness and then seeing how well it does in terms of explaining what's going on in the labor market. So on the effective searcher side of things, we turn to a paper by Robert Hall and Sam Schulhofer Wohl um, in which they've come up with estimates that let us construct a measure of effective searchers. Just conceptually to think about what we're doing here if you imagine that you had three groups of people in the population, you had unemployed people, people who are out of the labor force, people who are employed, you can think of them as each of those groups as having some effective search intensity that we're going to operationalize in terms of their job filling rate. And if you took the weighted sum of all of those groups, that would give you your measure of effective searchers. What we actually do is a little more complicated than that. We have 16 groups and not three, but that's the basic idea. The same thing on the vacancy side. We take measures of job openings and we adjust them for an estimate of recruiting intensity that we base on a paper by Steve Davis, Jason Faberman, and John Haltewanger. Just to preview our results, what the red line in this picture is showing you is the standard measure of labor market tightness, vacancies over unemployment. It's about 30% higher at the end of 2018 than it was early in 2001. The measure of effective tightness that we've, the generalized measure of labor market tightness that we've constructed is about the same now as it was at, in early in 2001. So we're getting a somewhat different answer. So let me walk through very quickly what we're doing to construct this measure of, of effective searchers and our measure of effective vacancies and then turn to looking at the results. So as I said, we're building our measure of effective searchers based on a paper by Hall and Schulhofer Wall. They define 16 different groups um, in the population. Uh, 13 of these groups are groups within the unemployed differentiated by the reason for their unemployment and how long they've been unemployed. 
They have two groups who are out of the labor force, people who want a job or say they don't want a job, and then the employed are their 16th group. They use data from the current population survey to estimate for each of those groups a job finding rate, that is the probability that somebody in that group either moves into employment or changes job, moves, makes a job to job transition. And we are interpreting these differences in job finding rates as differences in effective search intensity. Um, Hall and Schuhofer Wall model these group specific job finding rates. They essentially fit a model where the job finding rate for a group has a, a base period component. It has a component that represents changes in search intensity on the part of the group in response to changes in labor market tightness. And then they ha allow for possible trends in the, in the job finding rates. And what that lets us do is to construct alternative measures of effective search associated with each of these groups. Uh, the first version uses just the base period differences in job finding rates. The second incorporates that elasticity with response to labor market conditions, and the third incorporates the time trends. You can see that the, the second and third thing do make some difference. What I'm showing you here are selected estimates for some of the different groups we're looking at in how their search intensities have varied over time according to this metric. Um, the scales on these three are quite different. One thing that you can see is that the groups on the left, who are people who were recently laid off or, or recently lost their job, their probability of moving into a job is, relatively speaking, much higher than, for example, that of the long-term unemployed or the people who say they want a job uh, but aren't currently unemployed, and also much higher than the, the chance of moving to a different job for somebody who's already employed. But the the probabilities are not zero for the other groups. Um, we can also look at what just taking the population shares of these different groups, look at how the shares of effective searchers change over time. So in, the, in this chart, the groups here are people who um, uh, are employed. Uh, they are actually the largest share of people moving from into jobs or people who previously had a job, uh, people who say that they uh, are out of the labor force and didn't want a job, people who say that they were out of the labor force and wanted a job, and then we differentiate between the short-term and the long-term unemployed. I would make two comments about this. The share of effective job searchers, according to this metric, accounted for by the unemployed, is less than 30%. Most of the people who are moving into jobs, as I said earlier, are not people who are coming from unemployment. It's these other groups. You can also see the cyclicality in these shares. In the, the deep recession uh, that we've experienced, the share of the unemployed in this effective job searcher metric went up a lot, but that was also accompanied by declines in the shares of the employed who were, who were in these effective job searchers. Uh, another input into what we're doing is this recruiting intensity that I described. Um, this is based on a paper by Davis, Faberman, Faberman and Haltewanger. Um, what they find is, in essence, that in a, in a downturn, when the labor market is very weak, employers tend to be recruiting less intensively than when the labor market is very tight, and that has an effect on these metrics. Okay, so let's just take a look at what we're finding here. This is a graph that's just showing you, taking the, all of this into account on the effective searcher side, what happens to effective searchers over time. The red line is the unemployment rate, basically normalized to the share of the population. Those lines up at the top are all pretty similar. Those are our three different measures of, of generalized effective searchers. You can see that they are much less cyclical than the unemployment rate which kind of makes sense. Um, the other thing you can see is that they're not very different. That light blue line that's up at the top is the measure that um, just takes into account the changes in the shares of the different groups, holding their effective, effective search constant. Uh, 
The other two lines are the ones that allow that to vary over time. When the labor market is weak, the people search less intensively, this metric is saying, um, but it doesn't change the basic picture very much. There are, of course, some other measures out there that are intended to be more encompassing measures of available labor supply than the standard unemployment rate. Uh, one of them is the U6 rate that the Bureau of Labor Statistics publishes that adds to the unemployed people who are marginally attached and people who are part-time for economic reasons. Um, one, that measure doesn't weight these groups differently, it just adds them up. Another measure that's very similar in spirit to what we're doing is the Richmond Fed's non-employment index. Um, it looks at effective search among all of the non-employed, the unemployed, people who are out of the labor force. Uh, it also weights these groups up based on their relative job finding rates. What it doesn't do is include uh, search among the employed. So we can compare the behavior of the standard measure, the unemployment rate, to our measure, to these other two measures. The red line there is the, the, the movement over time in the unemployment rate. The, the next line up is the, an index based on the groups included in U6. The sort of greenish line above that is the Richmond Fed in, Fed's index. And then the, the line at the very top that's less cyclical than the others um, is our generalized effective searcher measure. Um, we also can take a look at the effective vacancies relative to standard vacancies. It's a little bit hard to see in the picture, the, um, but the orange line there is just vacancies. The, the darker blue line is adjusted vacancies, adjusting for employers' recruiting intensity. And you can see that that adjusted line is rather more cyclical than just the straight vacancy numbers. So those are the pieces that we're putting into what we're doing. Um, this is the figure I showed you at the very beginning. If you look at our generalized measure of labor market tightness, uh, V over U is the red line. The green lines, it's hard to see. They're, they're not very different, it turns out. Uh, the, those other lines are our measure of um, generalized measure of labor market tightness. Uh, as you can see, it's less cyclical than the standard measure, and as you can also see, it's not as high currently relative to history um, in, in contrast to the standard measure. So that's sort of the, the measure that we've constructed. We, we think that on conceptual grounds, this measure makes a lot of sense. You wanna take into account search on the part of you know, everybody who might be looking for work, but we'd also like to be able to say something about whether it actually works better. So what we've tried to do in order to evaluate the measure that we've constructed is to think about how well the, it does in uh, explaining hiring behavior. So we go back to that matching function and we say, well, this matching function has an implication about the job filling rate. So we can take the standard model um, and just look at you know, vacancies relative to unemployment and look at how well we can do at predicting the job filling rate with that as our, our, our approach. And then we can contrast that with how well we do using our more generalized measure. So that's the, uh, the next exercise that I want to show you. So let's start with comparing how well we do, as I said, in terms of predicting the, the job filling rate with our measure compared to just the standard V over U measure. In this picture, the I can't look too good on these colors. The, the line at the bottom, the sort of grayish line, is the actual job filling rate over time. The red line is the job filling rate predicted from the standard matching function using just vacancies and unemployment. It doesn't do very well. The line in the middle that's quite close to the actual job filling rate is the prediction that we get using our measure of effective 
vacancies relative to effective searchers. So we think we're doing quite a lot better on this metric. Um, we can compare that to how well we do if we use our U6 index. Uh, the U6 index doesn't do any better than the standard measure. Um, I, we think that's because you're adding in all of these extra people, the marginally attached and the part-time for economic reasons, but you're not taking into account how likely they are to actually fill jobs. Um, we also can take a look at the Richmond Fed Index, which is an, an index of non-employment, uh, very similar in spirit to our index, but it doesn't include the employed job-to-job -job changers. Um, it does quite a lot better than the standard measure, but it doesn't do as well as our measure that takes employed search into account. And we also have tried to do a little bit in the way of looking at what it is that's important about the, the pieces of our measure that are explaining our results. In order to do that, we've uh, gone just with our generalized labor market tightness measure where we assume fixed relative job finding rates for the different groups. We then drop out the employed and see what that does and then we drop out people who are out of the labor force and see what that does. Um, you can see, when, if you look at these measures, and it's probably clearer in the paper than it is here, um, if you start dropping out these groups, you get measures that are more cyclical than our you know, full-blown generalized measure. Uh, but we can also look at how well these alternative measures where we only take into account you know, some portion of the searchers who are out there. If we eliminate the employed from our metric, so we only look at effective searchers who are either unemployed or out of the labor force, um, we don't do quite as well in predicting the job filling rate. It's not bad, but it's, it, we're not doing as well as with the full-blown measure. And then if we drop out the people who are employed, the employed job-to-job -job changers, we really don't do as well. Um, we're, we're doing better than the standard measure, but uh, we're losing a lot of our explanatory power. So we think that what this is saying is that it's important to think, you know, not just about the unemployed and not just about people who are out of the labor force, but about these job-to-job -job changers and the role that they play in filling vacancies uh, that employers are advertising. So just to take stock here, um, we think that based on our generalized proof of concept measure, that the labor market is not currently as tight as suggested by the standard vacancies over unemployment measure. Um, our, our measure is quite a lot less cyclical than the standard measure. Um, the generalized measure does quite a lot better in terms of explaining how successful employers are at filling their, their vacancies. Some of that's coming from taking into account the composition of the pool of unemployed. Um, but it's, it's also very important, even more important, to take into account search among the employed and people who are out of the labor force. Um, we do a little bit better, I haven't really talked about this, if we, if we allow for variation in search intensities on the part of the people in these groups over time, but that's not the big thing that's driving this. Um, there's also a role that's played by variation in employer recruiting intensity over time, but again, that's not the biggest piece of what we're seeing. Um, so in, in terms of you know, as academics always want to do more <laughs> research, so I can't really conclude my talk without a few remarks about uh, next steps, including some thoughts about future research. As I said, what I've talked about here is very much a proof of concept. We've taken a set of estimates that were out there in the literature and have applied them to see whether this idea had, had promise. Um, I, we, I think there's a lot of refinement that could be done with this. We would like to return to the micro data to figure out what the best way to disaggregate the different groups in the population is. Um, you know, it might be that it's really important in, in addition to taking account of whether people say they want a job or don't want a job, uh, to also take into account why they say they're out of the labor force, whether they say they're retired or in school or, or something else. Um, 
It may be that in, in terms of the employed, it would make a it would help if we dis differentiated between people who were employed as much as they wanted to be working and people who said they were part-time for economic reasons. So we think there's some refinement there. Um, again, I haven't said too much about this. We're relying in our paper on inferring people's search intensities from observing their job finding success rates. But there also is some evidence out there, you know, direct evidence on intensity of search, how hard people are looking for work. And it would be very nice to, to reconcile those two things. It also would be very nice to have more direct evidence on uh, employer recruiting intensity. We do think there is a practical step that could be taken more or less right away, which, you know, especially if, if agreement could be reached on what the best way to break groups in the population out for this purpose is, which would be to begin producing a, a real-time generalized labor market tightness measure. <coughs> the only thing that you need to do that is information on base period relative job finding rates and the size of the groups which you can get every month out of the current population survey. So that would be something that it would be very straightforward to do. Um, we have not in this paper you know, gone the next step and tried to say, okay, you have this generalized labor market tightness measure. What's the, the maximum sustainable level of labor market tightness? Um, and to, to figure that out, you need to move to looking at how these measures relate to changes in wages and prices, but we've not gone there at, at this point. So let me stop and, and thank you for your, your time and attention. Now we have Jared Bernstein of um, the Center for Budget Priorities. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't. I have. I have precious little time, so I don't want to spend a lot of uh, uh, I mean, inadequate time to thank uh, the folks who helped me get here. I'm. I'm extremely uh, happy to be here. Happy to be anywhere, in fact. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I want to thank Ms. Mead. I want to thank uh, Vice Chair Clarida, and uh, and uh, all all the folks who are put together the conference. It was a, a um, oh, wait, here, let me get this started here. Uh, it was a, a huge uh, pleasure reading this paper, uh, nuanced, interesting, granular look that fits squarely into this growing literature that uh, recognizes that it, it takes a village of indicators to understand the extent of labor market slack and tightness, uh, and that there's a fault in our stars regarding our ability to uh, uh, identify some of the star variables that uh, Chair Powell talked about early within a kind of policy relevant interval. So anytime we're drilling down and getting away from the kind of one zero of the unemployment rate, uh, we're, we're doing useful work in this regard. Uh, I should say that A and B, uh, the village of indicators and the fault in our stars, are well recognized by the Federal Reserve, so I suspect the uh, point of, of, of uh, Catherine John's paper will be uh, much welcomed. The starting point here is that every working age person, even if they're working already, can be a factor in the amount of slack that's missing in, uh, in the unemployment rate, although while the unemployment rate takes a hit in a lot of these discussions, it's still full of uh, vital information, something I'm sure Catherine and John would agree with. Um, uh, but. Uh, uh, effective labor supply is greater than unemployment-based labor supply. I had my own uh, kind of folksy example of this uh, at home recently when my, my daughter came home from college and she, uh, we wanted her to get a job, my wife and I, and she believed that her effective labor supply was about 15 hours a week and we believed it was more than that. Uh, so in my, in my own house, uh, uh, we discovered more labor supply than, uh, than would have shown up in uh, many a survey. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm going to say we won, but there was a compromise. Uh, the unemployment, uh, the unemployed, in fact, uh, uh, Catherine didn't cite this number, the unemployment rate account for just 30% of the effective searchers. Now, of course, they have relative high search intensity, say, uh, compared to people with jobs, but uh, I didn't know that uh, they were such a relatively small share. Some of the key findings of the paper. Um, uh, the uh, effective uh, searches, uh, the effective searchers, as you heard, shave some of the cyclicality off the cycle. And that's because in booms, effective searchers create um, more effect effective uh, labor supply uh, 
than you'd get in, in you. Uh, there's a pro-cyclical kind of search intensity going on there, and certainly a, a pro-cyclical um, uh, employer intensity, recruiting intensity. In busts, they create a little bit less slack because search intensities or recruiting intensities in particular go down. And that's why you shave some of the edges off the cycle, uh, which is kind of recognizable to those of us who are scratching our heads asking why we're not seeing more pressure in uh, what looks like a very high pressure economy based on some of the more conventional metrics. Uh, the, uh, and, and as anyway, I won't read my bullet points, but you can see I'm just sort of repeating some of the things that, uh, that uh, uh, Catherine said. Um, but I wanted to do, I want to say the bulk of my comments, a, a broader assessment of, uh, of A&H, uh, Abraham Haltwanger, in the context of, uh, of what I understand the Fed Listens uh, initiative to be about. <clears throat> And uh, they note that their performance metric, as you heard, was how well the generalized uh, uh, measures do in explaining changes in the job filling rate, that's my bold, um, over time compared to the standard measures of labor market tightness. And uh, so the question I wanted to raise is how important is that metric to the problem at hand? Uh, if we find, as they did, that uh, their approach, uh, 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 adding, adding those E's there, effective vacancies, effective searchers, if we find that those uh, help uh, improve the job filling rate. How much do we care about the job filling rate? Definitely care some about it, but as Catherine said at the end of her uh, talk, we need to evaluate uh, the, uh, uh, the um, uh, impact of these uh, measurement improvements in what they add to our understanding of price dynamics, which would, you know, wages and prices. So I did two uh, simple exercises. Um, in, in the, the, the bars here show um, uh, R-squareds uh, in, in a second stage of a two-stage regression. Very simple stuff, and uh, uh, if uh, people may uh, are free to ar argue that I, I didn't uh, go about this the right way, but if, I, if there's a mistake here in the approach, it's the same mistake for all the different indicators, so maybe it's okay. And so what, what I did is, is I, I just regressed uh, the... Uh, annual change in, in, uh, in, the quarterly annual change in, in core PC inflation against uh, an, an expectation measure. So, so I netted that out and then I regressed various slack measures against the residual there. And the x-axis shows all the slack measures, the unemployment rate, the Richmond unemployment index, U6, the standard measure of tightness from uh, a and which is just a, a uh, uh, v over U, and then uh, there, uh, and I somehow switched from A and H to A and E. There, that's my addled brain at work. Uh, but that, uh, where you see A and H, a, that's like arts and entertainment or something. But uh, <laughs> think of A and H. Um, their measure of tightness, and then and then uh, their measure of of their just a generalized effective search measure. And in fact, if you're looking to what part of the variance in core inflation net of expectations is explained by these various slack measures, um, standard tightness does quite badly relative to some of the more conventional measures that we know and love. Their tightness measure does a little bit better, and their generalized search me me measure kind of gets, gets you to a bar uh, that's about the same height as all the others. So, you know, not a ton of added information there vis-a-vis uh, -vis explaining the variation in core inflation net of expectations. You can do the same exercise on wages. This is a coefficient from a regression of uh, nominal wage changes, uh, again, uh, monthly or quarterly wage changes uh, year over year. And uh, you take the coefficient on the, on, uh, on the slack indicator, there's a, there's a, a lag of, uh, of wage growth in here. You take the coefficient on the slack indicator and you multiply it by the standard deviation, so everything on the same scale. So same exercise here, but instead of looking at um, the part of the variance explained, uh, now we're just looking at the coefficient on the slack variable. And uh, it, the polarity is different for some of the tightness measures, um, but uh, they're all about the same in terms of magnitude. So uh, you're not, at least by these simple exercises, you're not getting um, uh, a lot more value add from uh, the, the tightness measures the way I did it on explaining the, the variation in wage growth or price growth. I still think the, uh, the uh, uh, measure is a worthy one that ought to be added to the dashboard, as I said, but I think more work, and, and again, ANH agreed that this, um, more work needs to be done uh, with, in my view, a different evaluation metric as opposed to the job filling rate. Let's look at uh, uh, at prices and, uh, and let's look at prices. So I do think uh, the measure, uh, given its its nuance, its comprehensiveness, all 
I agree with everything Catherine said, that it uh, belongs uh, as a measure in the dashboard, and I would encourage uh, Fed staff to look into that. Um, and I think there's another exercise that needs to be done, which is to see if it adds to the various methods that combine variables to find a latent signal. I find this work promising. There was, I think it's a 2011 paper by Fleischman and Roberts, a Fed paper. You take a bunch of indicators and you put them in the Kalman washing machine and, 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 and out comes uh, a, a signal that tends to, uh, I, in my view, uh, shave off some of the, some of the error and, and, and noise uh, and, and ends up with a more reliable signal. A good way to test uh, a contribution of a new metric like this is to put it into that framework. It's especially uh, potential, uh, potentially useful in periods like this when we're scratching our heads regarding labor market capacity, which I believe was the, uh, was the inspiration for, um, for the paper. And th those are just the points I made there. I wanted to use my last few minutes to talk about the broader lessons for Fed listens, which is one of the reasons I'm so enthused about this campaign. And here, uh, I'm going to cite some of their work, but also, as discussants are wont to do, some of my own, including a recent paper I did with Keith Bentley. Um, inflation's diminished response to the capacity constraints, the kind of flat Phillips curve that you heard Chair Powell talk about early, in tandem, and this is something we haven't talked about very much today, but in my view, is very much in the room in any Fed listens meeting, uh, any, any meeting that's, that's looking at the, uh, at the uh, success of the framework, is the uh, equalizing and the racial and gender benefits of running persistent high pressure labor markets. I argue that this creates an asymmetry that favors a lower for longer kind of position. And here I'm, uh, I was, I was uh, struck by some of the comments that Chair Powell made from the perspective of those, and they're, I'm talking about the bottom two thirds of the wage and income scale, who really depend on full employment to get ahead. Uh, the idea that it will take lower for longer unemployment to help push back on the threat of the ELB, of the effect of lower bound, is an excellent problem to have. I'm not dismissing the magnitude of the problem from the perspective of the Federal Reserve and the risk of downward uh, shifting of inflation expectations. But there's an opportunity in this risk because, the, uh, and this is my second bullet, the distributional and the positive racial impacts of high pressure labor markets strengthen this case. So the, uh, the benefits of a full employment economy, their equalizing impacts, their racial and gender impacts are uh, heightened in a, in, in a period where uh, uh, inflation uh, risks are dampened by a, a flat PC. Uh, I think that the pro-cyclicality of employer search intensity um, maps onto that uh, um, in, a, in an interesting way. So this begs the question, and it was a, a question that somebody asked from the audience about, about productivity earlier, of the potential for reverse hysteresis. So this is the idea that um, strong labor markets uh, don't just have a cyclical change, as we saw in some of Catherine's uh, 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 pictures, or pretty much any picture you look at a labor market variable now, but that they can in, um, invoke a structural change. So employer, the productivity examples, employers facing higher labor costs have to find new efficiencies if they want to keep their unit labor costs uh, uh, in place and sustain their profit margins. And so one way to do that is to find efficiency gains that you don't need in the slack economy. This goes back to uh, Verdun, uh, the evidence is, is somewhat uh, thin for reverse hysteresis, but I argue that it's a, an area of compelling research because not only are there cyclical benefits to, uh, to uh, running high pressure labor markets, they, there may well be supply side or structural benefits as well. Um, I wanted to show as an example of uh, the changes in employer uh, recruiting intensity. This is from a May 29th article in the New York Times, so a couple of days ago. No background check, drug test, or credit check, you're hired. Okay? That's not, I've seen uh, three or four articles like this. I've, I've heard of employers waiting outside uh, uh, prisons uh, to, to, to see if they can uh, uh, fill their, their recruiting needs. Um, this would not happen at five, six, seven percent unemployment. Uh, and yet, uh, uh, the dampened inflation pressures make this kind of thing possible. And so, um, I have uh, these concluding thoughts. I think that uh, uh, Catherine and John offer a welcome entry that uh, refines, very much refines our assessment of slack 
uh, and the uh, discovering effective labor supply um, is uh, uh, great for helping, is important to help understand how tight the job market is as their, their inspiration, but also begs the question of is that discovery a cyclical discovery or a structural discovery? If it's the latter, it's a supply side improvement that one would actually want to build into uh, an FRB US and certainly build into uh, 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 monetary policy uh, rules or, or decisions. Um, I view this as another vote for the conclusion that uh, um, uh, Bentley and I came to uh, in our uh, paper, which was really a paper on the benefits of full employment, where we looked at uh, uh, the, those benefits from the perspective of less advantaged workers. And we did find income and wage benefits that are probably very familiar to people here, but we also found very strong labor supply benefits. Uh, we found that particularly low-income single moms were extremely elastic to high-pressure labor markets. In fact, minorities in general. So our work is, is, is making a very explicit connection between high-pressure labor markets, increased labor supply, and again, especially in a climate of a flat Phillips curve, boy, is that an experiment worth uh, continuing. And so we're left with what, uh, uh, this is a quote from our paper, uh, uh, the, the thought that perhaps it's not too optimistic from my perspective, which may not be the same as uh, uh, someone who has to uh, you know, uh, worry about uh, uh, de-anchoring inflation, I get that, but it, it may, it, it's perhaps not too optimistic to suggest that there's occurred a flip in the internal consensus among some monetary policy makers. From the perspective of accelerating inflation, High pressure labor markets, once viewed as guilty until proven innocent, are now viewed as innocent until proven guilty. And I would just encourage uh, the Fed Listens uh, initiative to uh, uh, keep that uh, thought in mind and maybe help me understand whether that's uh, uh, too optimistic or a realistic view of a flipping perspective. Thank you very much. So we'll start taking questions, and um, as uh, many of you know, I don't know as many people as Yuri does, so um, I, if I refer to you as the person in the, um, I won't refer to you as the person in the gray jacket or the blue <laughs> jacket, because that won't be distinctive enough, but if I refer to you by some characteristic, forgive me in advance. So uh, are there any questions? So let's start. And please give your name and affiliation. Uh, Bill Washer, uh, Federal Reserve Board. Um, so Catherine, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your decision to include a search among the employed um, in your measure of labor market tightness. Um, from one standpoint, they have a job, so they're not unutilized labor in that respect. And it, if they leave a job for another job, they've created another vacancy. And the other, I guess the other impression I've had is we've always thought of the, of the quit rate as an indicator of labor market tightness. So high quits was a sign that um, labor markets were tightened. So I'm wondering how you think about uh, these various uh, factors. So we'll collect two or three questions. Okay. Okay. First of all, I just love this paper. It's so intuitive, okay? Um, but I have a few questions. Is there a natural rate of this vacancy over unemployment? Is it one? Is it not time varying? And when you add your adjustment, does it become time varying? And what's been happening to it? You know, I think what, uh, what I really do is I want that series. Okay, and uh, uh, Jared did some of this work in terms of putting this into a Phillips curve framework. I mean, I'm, there's a social story here that I've talked about, a social policy story, uh, but there's also, uh, which the Fed pays attention to, but there's also an inflation dynamic story, and I'd like to understand that better. So, just a wonderful paper, and I just want the series. Sam Schulhofer Wool, Chicago Fed. Uh, so I, I was excited to, to see that our work found some, some practical use. Uh, 
Uh, there was one issue that, that Bob Hall and I struggled with when we wrote this paper, which is related to some of the points Jared raised at the end about is this cyclical or, or structural. Uh, so, so this framework as fundamentally assumes that the search intensity or effectiveness of a particular group is, is a permanent characteristic of that group. Uh, and, and for example, it, it assumes that the long-term unemployed are just permanently uh, less, less effective job finders. Um, so I, I think this is a, a deeply pessimistic view of the world because it, it says, for example, in a recession, the recession goes on for a while, a bunch of people become long-term unemployed, um, and then they are, within the framework, assumed to be less effective job seekers, and, and then it lets policy off the hook because they're, they're not effective job seekers anymore and you can't do anything about it. Um, so is, is that the right assumption to make if you're trying to achieve maximum employment? Um, or should we be thinking about policy approaches that can increase the job finding rates of all groups in the economy? Okay, so why don't we give you a chance to respond? Great, thank you. Um, thank, let me just first thank Jared for his, his helpful comments. You're, you're absolutely right that the link between what we're about and what's happening with wages and prices really needs to be, to be sorted through. We've sort of done you know, one thing, but it's just a first step, and, and that, that's an obvious next step, is to look more carefully at, at that. So I would agree with you that that needs um, more work. I was interested in your comments about the potential for reverse hysteresis. This is sort of implicit in, our, in, in what we're doing. It, it certainly is true, I think, that in a very tight labor market that employers you know, ramp up their recruiting intensity, which is not just looking harder for people, but also doing other things to bring people in to jobs who they might not previously have considered. I mean, the, the big question is whether that's going to have persistent effects. I mean, certainly while the labor market is very tight, these people are, are more likely to be employed. But whether that's going to increase their, improve their employment prospects going forward, I think is, a, is, a, is an open question. Um, Bill Washer asked a question about our decision to include in our generalized searcher measure people who are employed. The reason that we think that that's the right thing to do is be, in, in our framework, we're looking at generalized tightness, you know, generalized vacancies relative to generalized searchers. As you said, when an employed person quits their job and moves somewhere else, they're likely to create a vacancy. And we're including that. We're always, all the measures are including that. So it's not symmetric to count those vacancies and then not count the fact that these employed people are available to fill jobs. So it, it really did seem to us like the right thing to do to count the search on the part of the em employed for consistency, if, if you will. Um, uh, Larry Meyer question about the, you know, is there a natural, ra natural rate of V over U? That sort of gets back to the, the questions that, that Jared was raising. And at this point, I don't, I don't know the answer. We're a little bit handicapped in, in terms of looking at this because we have less history. Uh, as, as you, you all may know, we only started collecting job vacancy data in the United States on a regular monthly basis in 2000, 2001. So it, it, we're just now getting to the point where we actually have enough data to start to do the kind of thing that, that John and I were talking about in the, in the paper. Um, but, I, but I think clearly there's more that, that we could do to try to tease out the answer to your uh, question. And then uh, Sam, who I haven't met <laughs> previously. Um, I, you know, I, in, in what we're doing, as you said, the, the baseline is that people in a particular group are a certain thing in terms of an, how many effective searchers they, they represent. Um, your, your modeling does build in some potential for elasticity of that with respect to, to labor market tightness. But this also gets back to something I mentioned very briefly at the conclusion of my remarks, which is, you know, in a, you know it was an alternative to trying to infer how you know, effective search 
on the part of people in a particular group from their job finding rates, it would be nice to be able to integrate this with you know, other evidence on um, intensity of search. And, and you know, I, I think that may be a, a, a partial path to addressing the question you raised. Can I make a quick uh, comment, uh, Lisa? Uh, so I want to just say a couple of words quickly about this notion of reverse hysteresis, because I think it's so important. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a critical potentiality. It's, uh, there, there's, as, as I think we've all said, the, the uh, evidence is, is not strong. I've, I've asked uh, uh, Larry Summers, Olivier Blanchard, and, and they've kind of said, yeah, you don't want to you don't want to go too far to the wishful thinking place on that sort of stuff. So you have to be careful uh, and not put a thumb on the scale. Um, uh, but uh, I, I I I think one and, and oh and I wanted to say there's a recent paper by Aronson et al. where there's a little section that reviews some of the literature. This gets to a question you raised, uh, Catherine, which finds some evidence of it, but it fades. So it maybe fades after after a few years. So it's not that it's purely cyclical. There's kind of a structural component, but the structural component seems to fade. Well, I think one of the reasons it may fade, and one of the reasons you may not find enough evidence for it, is because of a very stark nonlinearity in, in our labor market. The kinds of dynamics that I'm talking about that reach down into the labor supply and pull in people who face steep barriers to work, whether it's racial discrimination, a criminal background, a skill deficit, uh, the, 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 those barriers are not uh, leapt over until the unemployment rate gets really low and stays really low, maybe around where we are right now. So in one perspective, it's, it may be the case that we really haven't tested for reverse uh, hysteresis because we've just uh, not run enough uh, high pressure labor markets for long enough. Okay. So let's take a few more. Hi, Jan Hatzius, Goldman Sachs. Uh, in the spirit of kind of cross-checking the, uh, the unemployment rate as a measure of labor market slack, um, I was also curious about uh, your thoughts on, on other measures that, uh, that are often used for this, the quit rate, for example, or various surveys of household job availability or, uh, or skill shortages in the, in the business sector. Um, how, how, how good do you think those indicators are uh, relative to the to the measure you develop here, uh, and then I would also be very interested, uh, given how much you know about all this data, uh, and I and I realize that you don't have a natural rate for your uh, for your measure. Just what you think uh, where the labor market is at the moment relative to full employment defined as uh, the level that's consistent with about two percent inflation over the over the medium term. Uh, do you think we, we're still short of that? Do you think we're beyond that? Do you think we're roughly at that level? Um, thank you. Um, hi, uh, Silvana Duke, San Francisco Fed. Uh, your, your measure of search intensity is pro-cyclical, and, and that's very intuitive to me. But when you look at the literature, it often finds that search intensity is counter-cyclical which would mean that in good times people, people surge less and then it would increase the, the amount of tightness you, you have uh, in the economy. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. Hi, Julia Coronado with Macro Policy Perspectives. First, I want to thank you, the authors, for the paper. It's really uh, very interesting and, and I thought Jared's discussion was really great as well, so thank you for that. I have a question that's related to employer search intensity. Um, so I wonder if you've thought about like the changes that technology has brought and whether that's caused a sort of level shift or a break in your series of, of vacancies. So for example, I know a number of mid-level companies in trucking and warehousing and in home building that maintain now sort of permanent job openings posted and a small staff that just culls through the applicants that they get looking for the diamond in the rough. So that's a very low intensity job search, but it's so low cost now given all the job websites that are available and, it, and the technology that's available to do this autom in an automated fashion. So have you thought about this sort of possibility that there's a level break in your measure of, of vacancies and if you can control for that in some way, then I think maybe your cyclical measure would be enhanced and maybe give you a somewhat different answer and maybe to, to Jared's point, a different answer in terms of its, its relevance for 
wages and, um, and, and inflation and things that the Fed cares about. Okay. Um, great. Let me uh, just uh, address um, some, of, some of these questions, uh, not, not in, in order. Uh, one of the questions related to the distinction between what I presented, which was uh, an, an estimate showing search intensity to be pro-cyclical, um, whereas some of the literature has found evidence of counter-cyclical search intensity. Just to, to, cl to clarify the difference between what we're doing and what's been done in the literature, um, what we're doing is inferring search intensity from looking at fluctuations in uh, job finding rates, essentially. So we're, we're making an inference from outcomes, whereas the literature is looking at direct evidence on how intensively people are searching. Uh, either how many methods of search they're using or, in some cases, data from the American Time Use Survey on the number of minutes that they spend searching. I'm a big fan of the American Time Use Survey, <laughs> but I have to confess that I'm a little skeptical that those estimates are really picking up what you want in terms of, of search intensity. Um, the average person responding to the American Time Use Survey reports I believe it's 19.4 activities per day, which means that the length of the average activity that people are reporting is over an hour. And I think if people are you know, spending a little time here or there doing something, looking for work, that it's not necessarily going to show up well in those data. Particularly for employed people, you're not going to pick up the time that they spend searching at all, because work is a black box. When you go to work, all of the time from them to when you say you stopped working is just work. You're not going to be picking up search intensity. So I think there's more to be done on this, but I am skeptical of some of those findings about search intensity being counter-cyclical, which, which also seems very counterintuitive uh, to me. Uh, Jan asked a, a question about alternative measures of, of labor market conditions, things like the, the quit rate, which I, I have to confess, I haven't thought hard. And Bill Washer raised this question, and I didn't answer it when he asked it either. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how many times can we evade this? Um, I, I, I have to be honest, I haven't really thought through how what we're doing relates to, to looking at an indicator like the, the, the quit rate. I, I do have a comment about you know, some of these, these measures that purport to get at skill shortages and mismatch between the jobs that employers are trying to fill and the skills that, that the people out there have. I, I, I think this whole notion of mismatch is really not very well defined. Um, if you think about it from you, the, what, what people often do is they'll look at the occupations of jobs that employers are trying to fill and the occupations of the unemployed people. Aside from the fact that the unemployed aren't the only available people, that's sort of problematic because any given unemployed person might be able to do a whole variety of things. And if you just look at that match between the occupation of the employer's jobs and their last occupation, you're not going to pick that up. Um, it's also true on the employer side that an employer has quite a lot of flexibility in many cases, or at least some discretion, about how they're going to structure the work that they're doing. And so if they can't find somebody to do exactly what they want, they could restructure the jobs. And, and so that there's, again, the mismatch concept is a little elusive, I think. And then when you bring in the sorts of things that we were talking about, if you're looking at the occupations employers want to fill and the occupations of the unemployed, the, per, the employer may well not fill that job from some, by hiring somebody who's unemployed. They might recruit somebody else who already is employed and there's a job ladder. And the, the, the unemployed people may be quite well qualified to fill the jobs at the bottom of that job ladder. So I, I, I guess I'm just very skeptical about this notion that mismatch in the labor market is a significant component of um, you know, difficulty in 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 the in, in market functioning. I'm just I'm just not convinced that it's a, a very serious um, problem. So, the the I, I don't have a view. I have to say about what the 
the you know effective vacancies over effective searchers star is. I, I'm, I, I hope you will forgive me if I, I punt on that at this point. Um, and I, it's a very interesting comment about changes in employer search technology and how that might be affecting what we're seeing. I mean, this idea of having permanent vacancies is not a new thing. I, I wrote my dissertation more years ago than <laughs> I like to think on the measurement of job vacancies. Um, and you know, this was in along about 1980. Um, and even, even at that point, there were, it, you know, one of the difficulties that I ran into in trying to think about this was this, you know, employers who maintain these permanent job openings. So it may be that it's become more prevalent, but it's certainly not a new, a new thing. Um, though the, the, the comment about thinking about changes in technology is, is a good one and something we should think about. Let me make a couple of comments, if that's okay. Uh, so. Um, for, I, I really want to very much, very strongly associate my comments uh, with Catherine's on mismatch. I don't have too much to add to that other than there's a great paragraph in the paper on it. And uh, one of the things that I came away from the paper, and there's been other papers that have made the same point, is that the pro-cyclicality of recruiting intensity itself uh, challenges the, mis, uh, the mismatch hypothesis. And the reason that's important is because it's such a pervasive notion out there and, and, and with, without a lot of backup. Um, I did want to quickly speak to uh, Jan's uh, very direct question of are we at full employment? Just it seems like an interesting place to, to raise that question. Um, and uh, you know, I very much associate myself with the Twitter account of President Kashkari on that one. Uh, 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 the, uh, I think the absence of uh, inflationary or uh, particularly uh, significant wage pressures suggests that we're closing in on full employment uh, more so than, than, than being there uh, yet. But I think the variable that uh, deserves a lot of attention in that question is the uh, labor share of national income, which remains uh, uniquely depressed for this uh, point in the cycle. And at least in my view, and there are a lot of people in here who uh, might offer substantive pushback that I'd like to hear it, uh, that offers significant room for non-inflationary uh, wage gains. I see your hand, Dan. I got the mic, so I guess it's mine. Um, sorry. <laughs> Diane Swan, Grant Thornton, recovering from laryngitis. Thank you guys for an incredible paper. And I did have the same question that Julia did, but in addition to that, the structural factors that I see in the labor market today versus 1999 when um, we got that increased supply in labor market from a tight labor market. The issues on uh, for, on uh, convicts, uh, felons can't drive across uh, state borders, so they can't be truck drivers. The regulations on manufacturers and mm. testing for drugs are much higher threshold than they once were. Although I did find out once I started working for a consulting firm, they don't test for drugs for some reason, um, <laughs> which may have its own reasons. Not mine personally, but I think I've witnessed some. Um, but I think those are some things that we need to think about some of the structural hurdles to that supply coming in, and I wondered your comments on that as well. Hi, I just wanted to ask Catherine about uh, any micro evidence on the impact of job to job transitions on wages versus unemployment to job transitions on wages. So if one of the implications of your work is for the impact of slack on wages, and we're trying to uh, uh, learn about a wage Phillips curve, then your measure, the composition of your measure might have different implications for you know, wage inflation coming from your broader measure um, that includes job-to-job yeah. -job transitions. And, and um, we didn't detect any of that in Jared's regressions, but the micro evidence I think might speak to it more directly and, and mm -hmm. you could probably comment on that. Hi, uh, Austin Goolsby, the University of Chicago Business School. I'd, I'd like to follow up on Jan's comment there and, um, and Jared's discussion. I think the Fed really cares about this question because of the dual mandate and that you got to figure out, well, what does it mean to be at full employment? And we, our use of the unemployment rate breaks down uh, because the Nehru is, is moving all over the place or uh, appears to be. Uh, 
partly because the rise of disability or because of demographic changes or choices of, of dropping out of the labor force when having kids, for whatever reason, the unemployment rate doesn't fully tell you when you're at full employment. And I am a little worried that just measuring vacancies is going to have that same, it's floating around what, what, the, what the ideal is, is floating around. Just because the nature of what is a vacancy has changed. There was a time when we used to measure it uh, in the newspaper as classified ad listings. And if you based it on that, you'd go, wow, there's no vacancies left. And then just no <laughs> newspapers either. But uh, the, the issues of the rising globalization of many industries, the potentially the rise of monopsony power or bargaining power of the employers, um, and what's happening to the productivity growth rate of workers will directly influence the hiring rate, the quit rate, the, the search intensity of the firm. So look at just at the aggregate, I think th there, there may be some issues, and, and I would strongly encourage you to incorporate the wages, not just measures of quantity. Um, the great puzzle is if we're anywhere close to a tight labor market, why aren't wages going up? And my, my thought would be, can't you use the cross-sectional information that's, that's embodied in these uh, flows measures to tell you something about, so for example, if construction vacancies, if a vacancy in the construction industry either has no meaning or that meaning has changed over time, can't you kind of see that? Can't you use cross-sectional information to, to test whether there's wage pressures um, from, from tightness of the labor market? Okay. We'll take one more question. Okay. Uh, Rob Kaplan, Dallas Fed. Um, thank you for your, for your uh, paper and for your comments. Um, one of the things we've done a lot of work on in the 11th District, which is Texas as well as uh, New Mexico and Louisiana, is the issue of changing demographics over the last 20 years and a particularly lagging math, science, and reading, particularly reading skills for at-risk groups and the need for expanded pre-K, improved education, as well as skills training. And I know it doesn't go directly to your paper, but I would be interested to hear your views on what we could do in the education system, improving math, science, and reading, particularly early. Um, and that addresses these at-risk groups that, that might help improve adaptability as well as skills training that might help there too, and what implications would it have for uh, the labor force? Okay. Um, so let me just try to respond to, again, some of these, these comments. Um, several people are, have, have quite appropriately pushed on the issue of how changes in the structural changes in the labor market might affect the meaning of what we're seeing in terms of vacancies, unemployment, effective vacancies, effective searchers. And I, I think clearly that's something that we, we need to pay more attention to. Um, it's a great thing that we have data from the job openings and labor turnover survey. It's a really, it's not a huge survey. So Austin, in terms of trying to exploit cross-sectional variation, there's some things that we can do, but the, it's, somewhat, it's somewhat limited. We can look at data by broad industry. We can look at data by broad region. Um, I like to think that the job openings and labor turnover survey has really proven its value. It was, it was a a survey back in the era when there was money available to statistical agencies to launch new initiatives that I, I was able to get launched at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So I'm very fond of this survey. Um, but given that it's proven its value in terms of insights about the labor market, I, I think there would be value in expanding its the, the survey so that you could do more of this disaggregated looking at the, the data that, that you were talking about. Um, Jan, in terms of your question about what the micro evidence shows, um, I mean, I'm not sure I have a very good answer. It, it, there is some evidence that people who are job-to-job -job changers or potential job-to-job -job changers get better offers 
than people who are, uh, are unemployed. But I haven't thought, honestly, haven't thought through what the implications of, of that are for the relationship between our measure and, and, and wage growth. Um, and I, in terms of the, the de changing demographics and um, STEM education and, and so on, um, I, I'm not sure I have a lot to add to the, you know, the really good thinking that, that folks at the Dallas Fed and elsewhere have done on this. It, it, we know that it's extremely important in terms of how kids end up, what kind of education they get at a young age. and. You know, so you know, other than, than reinforcing the importance of early childhood and, and elementary <coughs> education, I, I don't know that I have a lot to add. Um, I wanted to quickly uh, speak to Austin's uh, point. I, I do think, I think this is what you were getting at, Austin, that uh, you know, chasing uh, another star variable uh, may not yield a lot of pay dirt uh, based on uh, the, uh, the challenges you raised. I, that, that, that has certainly been consistent with my work and that of many others, uh, especially if you look at either a rolling regression or a Kalman approach, uh, very hard to distinguish any estimates from zero at this point. Um, but I do think that the tight labor market is actually driving uh, wages up a bit, which is, uh, which is good news. Um, if you look at uh, just the nominal series, the one that gonna, we're going to get a new installment on on Friday, uh, it was kind of stuck at two. And then as the job market tightened, it went up to two and a half. And now it's, and now it's around three. And of course, inflation, as we know, has, has been low, such that, uh, that real wages have been growing you know, somewhat close to the rate of productivity growth. Um, What's been uh, notable from my perspective, and I think keys into my comments on the, the important benefits of high pressure labor markets, is that wage increases have actually been larger at the bottom of, of the scale. And uh, again, to me, that's a critical uh, uh, benefit and development that should continue to be tapped. Okay, have more questions? Hi, Lou Alexander from Nomura. Um, I'd like to ask the panelists to talk a little bit about how they think about the benefits of pushing labor markets actually beyond full employment in the following context. Um, so much of our thinking about monetary policy post the great inflation is sort of what we have embedded into us is you shouldn't do that because it creates an inflationary bias to policy. We're here at a conference that's really about the negative bias, the deflationary consequences of policy when neutral rates are low. And my question is, is there actually an advantage to, in some sense, reversing that instinct, which is deeply embedded in all our DNA, to not go beyond full employment in an environment where we're really worried about the deflationary effects of low neutral rates? So I, I'll, I, I can give a, a, my partial answer to that, it, which is, um, if, you, if you think about, you know, although I have been arguing for a broader measure in terms of thinking about the tightness of the labor market, th this is a case where focusing on the unemployed seems really appropriate. And it's, it's very clear that for a lot of people, unemployment is a really serious hardship. So if you think about balancing the risks between you know, pushing the economy to you know, past full employment and bringing some of those people into the, into the labor market, um, there, there's a lot of gain there. At this point, the risk of inflation seems muted at best. I, I mean, that's a trade-off I personally would make, but I, I, I don't know that everyone would agree. I would agree, and uh, <laughs> I, um, and and yeah, I, I thought the way you teed up the question was uh, was uh, exactly right, and and I think you know, quite resonant with that quote from. Uh, the paper that, that uh, uh, Bentley and I authored where, where we argued that perhaps uh, innocent till proven guilty is the right way to think about uh, these dynamics right now. But I'll just add that, in fact, at least based on the SCP, uh, we've been doing that experiment. And uh, it, it is my great, uh, it, is, it, it is a great acknowledgment to uh, the thinking of many of the people who are sitting here today that the Fed has been willing to entertain uh, this possibility and the notion of pushing back on that historical bias, in my view, what I hear is embedded in many of the comments of uh, members of the S FOMC, with uh, uh, respect to to a balance of of maintaining uh, the dual mandate. So I think we are officially out of time. <laughs> <laughs>
unless uh, there's going to be more time added. There's not going to be more time added. So um, <laughs> I, I, I see because it continues to count down. So thank you so much for your engagement in this conversation and look forward to conversation over lunch.